Are there more people suddenly underneath your roof, sheltering at home with you? Just how cozy is it? Or is it just the two of you? Or maybe it's just you and a four-legged friend or not. Regardless of what your situation is, communication is changing while we are sheltering at home with some more stressors, some less of other things that we'd like to have in our lives. And that's what today's episode is all about. This episode, however, is a keeper. So if you are coming long after COVID-19 is nothing but a distant memory, and please hurry if you can with that, then listen anyway, because communication among couples and among anyone really is what we're addressing today. And my guest is Dr. Sarah Rattray, and she is a couples communication expert. She shared some golden nuggets about how to improve really any communication, but the communication you have with other people living under the same roof right now or not living under the same roof right now, whom you may only be communicating with via Zoom or your telephone, could also benefit from what you're about to hear. Dr. Sarah Rattray, couples psychologist, has spent the last 30 years helping couples create the relationship they always wish they'd had with the power to make changes that last. She specializes in helping couples rekindle their connection and communicate safely about what really matters to them so they feel seen, heard, understood, and supported. Right now, she's creating workshops to help you navigate all the relationship challenges of this stressful time with grace and kindness toward each other. Dr. Rattray, thanks so much for being here. You are welcome, Deborah. I'm glad to be here. It is a pleasure. Well, I, you know, in the green room, before we actually went live, we'll have to share this with listeners. I was sharing that, you know, like many families getting together via Zoom was uh, the way we spent our Saturday night. Actually, I can fondly refer to that as Saturday Night Live because Mm -hmm. where, you know, my sister-in-law was in front of the camera, like, can you see me? Can you see (laughs) everything? I was like, oh my gosh. (laughs) But What really came out of that was, you know, what happens when, you know, maybe two people who are not used to being in that same enclosed environment 24-7, who also are very strong personalities and have unique ways of doing things, what might happen in that situation that we're in right now. And I think one of my sisters or sister-in-law, I can't remember which, volunteered that when her husband retired, they had to get therapy because suddenly there were a lot of really helpful suggestions coming out and she already had a way of doing it and had for the last couple of decades. But I would imagine there's a lot of that going on right now. So enlighten us maybe if you can about how do you deal with situations like this? Well, those are some great um, examples that so many people are living with right now, but also, as you said, just with normal life phases like retirement. So there's a lot of different parts to this. Um, One is that we have to be able to let each other know what we need. Uh, We have to have a way to tell our partners how something is sitting with us and what we need. So in one of your examples of the quote unquote helpful suggestions, um, if I want to um, be given a helpful suggestion or I want to be asked whether or not I'm open to a helpful suggestion, I should be able to share that with my partner. So what I mean is, 
you know, if you want to say, gee, honey, you could wash the dishes this way or, you know, whatever it is, you're, you're now that you're home for the first time, um, ask me if I am up to hearing your suggestion um, or I want to be able to tell you. So let me, this is kind of jumping the gun a little bit, but I want to give you um, a quick little uh, set of tips for how to ask for what you need. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. So um, anything that you want to say, and I do want to take some time to go into this, you want to think this through in your head before you say it to your loved one. Um, so there, I'm going to ask you to think through in your head four different parts. The first thing is what is it that you want to talk about? So in this example, it might be when you give me suggestions for running the house. That's the, that's the what or the about what. The second thing is how do I feel about it? So I really have to take some time and think about it. Am I bothered? Am I annoyed? Am I insulted? Um, you know, how is it that I feel? The third thing is, do I have, do I have, or what is my clear request for what I want from you differently? So I really have to think that through. Um, do I want to ask you to check in with me first? Do I want to ask you to not give me any suggestions? Do, you know, what is my request of you? Do I want you to ask me to explain to you why I do the things the way that I do them? Whatever my clear request is for how I want it different, I have to get clear in my head. And then the fourth thing, which um, is actually the first thing you're going to say out loud, is taking a couple of minutes and think about something that's similar to this that you actually really appreciate about your partner. So if there's a way that your partner checks in with you first that you really appreciate, remember a time that they did that. What's an example of when they did that so well that you appreciated? So here's how we're going to put it all together. You ready for this? I'm ready. So let's say you're my partner and you've been giving me the suggestions and it's really bothering you. Um, I'm going to think this through and then I'm going to say to you, I'm going to go find you in our house and I'm going to see what you're doing. I'm going to see if you're available to talk and I'm going to say, hey, Deborah. Yes. Okay. See, that's super important. If you don't answer me, it means you're not, you're not even ready to hear me start to speak. So a lot of times um, a mistake that we make is we just start talking and mm. the, our, the other person who we're talking to can very easily be startled, can be surprised. And so this is going off into what I want to spend some time talking about more today. But at this moment in time, none of us need to be startled or surprised. Um, so going back to this example, so if I say, Hey, Deborah. Yes. Do you have a second? Sure. Um, I wanted to talk to you about something. Is this a good time or is there a better time a little later? This is great. Thank you. Okay. So, Deborah, remember last week when we were, um, you know, talking about our business, I really loved the way you listened to me so well. You were really, um, supportive. And I felt that was a great conversation. And um, I want to have more conversations that feel like that. Do you remember that time, Deborah? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So what I just wanted to say is sometimes when you give me um, a helpful suggestion about the household, it makes me feel kind of... Um, I don't know, like scrutinized or kind of um, um, almost criticized. And that doesn't feel really good to me. And I want to feel, you know, supportive and heard. So what I was thinking that might work for me is when you have an idea for how I could do something differently, could you check in with me first and ask me if I'm open to hearing it? Do you think that could work? 
I see what you're asking. Yes, I do. You do. What, what is it that, you, what are you saying? I completely understand. Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you. So Deborah, thank you for role playing this with me. <laughs> um, so that's, that's like a basic introduction to asking for what you need, asking for what I need. If I'm offended by these brand new helpful suggestions, I have to let you know. How could you know? You don't know. So I'm going to tell you, this is what's happening. This is how I feel. This is how I want it instead. And I preface this by sharing with you something that I really appreciate about you. So good. So let me summarize a couple of things and then correct me, please, if if I don't have this right. But I kept hearing you asking permission kind of from the beginning and all the way through. And it, in my interpretation, that was just very respectful of the other person is how that landed. Is that good summary of, of important pieces of that communication? Um, 100%, Deborah, that's totally correct. And that's really, really key. So right now, particularly, but of course, in the rest of our lives, we go through times of extreme stress where we are on edge. Um, we are alert to danger. You know, right now, Everything we hear on the news um, all day long, we're barraged with startling um, information that keeps us feeling unsafe. So by talking to each other respectfully, you know, checking in, when, the way you said kind of asking permission every step of the way, that is very soothing to both of our nervous systems. That settles us down. That says to each other, this is safe between the two of us. And that's what we want to open up, whatever we want to talk about, whatever the communication is, we want to nurture an environment of safety between the two of us where we know we can share with each other what we're thinking and feeling. Oh, I love that. So this kind of conversation then, um, you know, I would just imagine with our everybody's heightened stress level, potentially, um, and feeling a little bit threatened from all sides, then those people closest to you, although they can easily become targets, become your best ally. So can you share some more? What are some more tips that we can use to set up good, calm conversation? Well, I really liked what you said that we want to kind of switch each other from being targets to, yeah. to being our allies. So we can be leaders in our own homes for how to establish that being each other's allies. And um, as I've started to mention already, that's being aware that the way we speak can create an environment of safety, or it can heighten that stress and alarm. Um, and so that's really whatever you want to say out loud. Could you take a moment and think it through before you say it and look at the other person, check in with the other person. Are they up to hearing it? So, you know, let's say I'm sitting here um, either reading a very upsetting news story, or maybe I'm doing some work and I'm, and I'm focusing and all of a sudden you read something and you say, oh my gosh, did you see this thing? You know, you're going to startle me. I'm already, you know, overwhelmed with what I'm doing. And now you've kind of filled my, my stress bucket to overflowing without me becoming aware. So we can avoid that happening between the two of us by, you know, if you looked over at me and you see, wow, it looks like Sarah's really concentrating hard. This might not be the best time to just tell her about, the scary thing I saw on the news. Um, so, so that's just the first thing is to be aware that you have something you want to say, take a moment and really look at and check in with the other person. What are they up to hearing right now? Um, another tip that I want to give, which is super basic, it goes along with this, 
is if you want the other person's attention, be sure you go to the same room that they're in so you can see them. Don't call from another room. And a great way to get their attention, just like I did with you, is to say their name. Hey, Deborah. They right. Well, and so if they don't respond. I don't get to keep going because uh, you probably have experienced this so many times, Deborah. Someone is halfway into telling you the thing that they're telling you before you even realize they're talking to you. Um, and another thing we don't have right now is a feeling of control over what's going on. We feel so out of control in our lives. I don't want yet another way to feel out of control in my own home. So if you want to tell me something, I want buy-in that I'm even listening before you keep going. I hate that scrambling feeling of missing the first half of what you said because I didn't even know you were talking. So we want our home to be a refuge where we don't have that out of control uh, kind of situation. Such a good point. And I'm going to ask a question that I think is a, I'm going to admit right away, it's a little bit hard for me to phrase it into a specific question. And I'm not sure if it's something that you can answer or it's just worth discussion. So I'll phrase it that way and and, and, uh, take the pressure off. (laughs) But I think when you said, you know, how can you ask for what you need or, you know, request it in a way that's safe and we can all stay calm? I totally respect that. However, I often think that it's easy for people, especially women, to often know what they don't want or need, but maybe a little bit hard for them to actually phrase what they do. Any comments on that? Okay. So um, when I was talking about a clear request, one, one clear request could be, hey, honey, I actually am not sure what I want differently. So my request is, could the two of us sit down and talk it through as a team to help me figure out what's working for me and what's not working for me? Ooh, I like that. So so my clear request might be, I need help figuring out what it is I want. And that's fine. So I don't have to... And, 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 and in fact, it's best if I don't have the answer for the two of us before we even go into it. You know, if I trust you and you're my partner and we're in this together, I get to say, this doesn't feel right. When, when you give me helpful suggestions, it makes me feel, I don't know, on edge, but I can't figure out what would work better. Could we sit down together and talk through how I'm feeling and what might work better? So that's one idea. That is a great idea. And then the second thing you said, sometimes we know what we don't want. So I could say to you, it doesn't feel good to me when you make helpful suggestions. And I'd really like it if you don't do that anymore. However, I'm not sure what I want instead. That's fair. Yeah, the golden. Both of those are very, very helpful. I have another question. So as you're talking, we're talking about couples. So I'm going to open this up a little bit. But right now there are potentially, say, adult children, you know, who may have come home from college and they're under the, the same roof. Does communication like this also apply to, you know, our offspring or our parents? I mean, how is a uh, conversation between couples different or unique or not? <laughs> well, in the broadest sense, absolutely. Communic- good communication is good communication. I think um, between partners, we're usually, in the in better cases, starting on the assumption that we really love each other and we're committed to getting along. We might have quote unquote adult children or like you know college age children, and they might be very annoyed to be at home. Uh, so they might not necessarily be committed. To having a great conversation with us, but but let's assume that whoever it is is in that's in our home with us, they want to have a good conversation. So here is um, you know very similar actually to my last answer to you, Deborah. We can start 
with a conversation to say, you know, let's say, Deborah, you're my adult child. Hey, Deborah, now that you're unexpectedly home and we're living together, I would love to have a really, you know, great family talk about what we expect from each other when we're talking. Can we sit down, set aside some time together to talk about what kind of communication feels right to us right now so we can create it and build it together? Could we just text about that? <laughs> Sorry, I could not resist. <laughs> oh, Deborah. Um, never, never lose your sense of humor, right? Okay. <laughs> so let me try that again from the top. I would love to. That would be great. <laughs> you know what we can do by text, Deborah, is we can set it up by text. So, you know, Another thing that I recommend is that, you know, whether it's now under stress or any time, that when you have, you know, a kind of a big important conversation that you set it up in advance and you want to pick both a time and a place that are as safe and stress-free as possible. So, you know, times in my life that are not good to talk to me are first thing when I wake up in the morning, last thing before I go to bed. Um, anytime when I have a deadline that I'm racing around to meet, those are not good times to talk to me. And, um, you know, the people that I live with are going to have their own variations on that. You know, maybe somebody I live with has great conversations late at night, but since I don't, we're going to avoid that time. Um, and then another thing is where physically, where do we have a good conversation? If we are always sniping with each other in the kitchen, let's not talk in the kitchen. Um, if we can set up a mood for, as a family with some candles um, and some soft music in, you know, at the dining table or something, maybe that makes it uh, condu uh, what do I want to say? Cozy and inviting. So we could set that up by text. I could say, you know, I could text you. When is a good time that you'll have some time without interruption and good energy? And we can do that by text. Where I'm thinking maybe let's sit at the dining table or I'm thinking maybe let's uh, go out on, on the patio. Um, so those are things that we totally could arrange by text. So I have another uh, tip, but but uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to, yeah, I want to um, stop for just for a second because I think your your last few tips that looking and addressing times of day that are better for you and or for somebody else or not the ideal times, that was rich as well as locations that might be tied to certain emotions or connotations and experiences that have already happened. Love those two. And go go ahead. I want to ask a question too um, about, are there some good ways to get conversation flowing like games um, that you might recommend or conversation starters or prompts that could be used? Gotcha. Well, so yes. Uh, I'm glad you liked the tips about the t setting up a time and setting up a place. Um, to expand on that just a little bit more, you know, let's say we're having a family meeting with the four of us and it's going to be tomorrow at dinner time, and we've set it up a day in advance. Let's all honor this and put it in our appointment calendars. Um, let's all get reminders. You know, let's treat this as important. Like you said earlier, this is all very respectful that I'm saying I'm setting aside this this time and I'm going to honor it. I'm going to remember it. So one of the ways to arrive in the best frame of mind, that's, this is not exactly your question, but to arrive in the best frame of mind, if we're at all stressed out or if we're talking about something heavy or challenging, um, let us each take a few minutes, five minutes, 10, 15 minutes, depending on what we need, and do something calm and relaxing. So, you know, Deborah, if you like uh, yoga, but I like uh, 
deep breathing. We're going to each go in our own places in our home and do that relaxation for a few minutes. Settle down our nervous system, you know, back as far away as we can from fight or flight and be as relaxed and calm as we possibly can. Um, when we are relaxed and calm, we have access to our sense of humor, to um, our creative problem solving, to our empathy and compassion. So all of those um, resources in us are opened up and available as the more relaxed that we can possibly be. I love that. Great suggestion. So in terms of conversation starters, the way that I was uh, describing earlier, kind of asking for what you want, um, that's setting the stage in general like there's not a mystery i'm not i'm not tricking you to come to the table i'm saying i want to talk about this um but um uh, another really fascinating um lens through which we can talk about our different opinions is um uh, being curious and open with each other about what the values are that we have that inform our decisions. So that's kind of big. So I want to talk about that for a second. What are the values that are informing our different opinions? Um, are you ready for that? Ready. Yep. So, um, you know, let's say, oh, here's a great one. So helpful suggestions. Let's say I've been loading the dishwasher, you know, the, the major dishwasher loader for all these years. And now all of a sudden you're home and you're watching me load the dishwasher and you have some different opinions, right? Oh yeah. Now, um, my opinion for how to load the dishwasher is based on values that I have, but I might not be aware that it's based on value. So I, I know like what I do. Do I really know why I do it? And do you know why you do it? So here's an example for me. Um, when I was a kid, my parents subscribed to Consumer Reports magazine, and I literally read that magazine every month when it arrived in the mail. I read it cover to cover and I was fascinated by their testing rubrics. And I remember, you know, one of uh, Consumer Reports testing rubrics was, was um, ultimate cleanliness. So they would test all the different dishwashers and they would see which one got things the cleanest. And their method of loading the dishwasher was everything facing the center. Um, so why when so now when I load a dishwasher, my rubric is ultimate cleanliness based on this history that I have um, from a child reading Consumer Reports magazine. But surprisingly, there are several different uh, values that one might have uh, when it comes to loading the dishwasher. So Deborah, if you have a guess as to one, I'd love to hear it. Otherwise, I'll share a few with you. I do not. I just know that <laughs> when my brother and sister-in-law were here, we had a conversation about whether we put the forks up or down. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, can you imagine why might somebody load them up versus down? What is a value that might inform both of those positions? Well, gosh, I'm going to struggle with a value. I just always thought that the water would run down and the food would run down and um, hygiene. So reaching okay. in. Germs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So one value could be hygiene. I don't want the eating area to be around like being touched. But now think about a different value. What about getting poked in your hand? So safety. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So if my value is I don't want anyone to hurt themselves while loading the dishwasher. So I face everything down. Now, that's a pretty good value. As a family member, I can respect that. You don't want anyone to get injured, mm -hmm. right? That's a right. great value. Now, as a family member, I really respect the value of protecting our hygiene. We don't want things to get dirty and not clean enough or whatever. That's a different value. So 
the, you know, all, all the, now, now here's some other values when it comes to loading the dishwasher. One value could be, I don't want to spend any time on it. I want to spend time with the family. So I don't care. I'm going to throw it in as quick as I can and get back out of the room. Now that might be hard to understand if you don't understand the value, but can you appreciate the value of me wanting to spend so much time with you? I don't want to waste it on the dishwasher. Is that a kind of a nice value? That's a very nice value. It's a very nice value. Now, here's another value. I want to put as many things in there as humanly yep. possible to save energy and water. Is that a good value? It's a great value. Yes. Um, now, I now here's another value. I don't want any of our things broken. So I want lots and lots of room around everything. I don't want anything to bump or, or you know, jumble around and get in risk of chipping. Is that a good value? Good value. Okay. So now you can see how we can fight about the dishwasher. And you might want to give me a helpful tip that I'm doing it quote unquote, if you were seeing me now, you'd see me with the fingers in the air, quote unquote, wrong. You're doing it wrong. But am I doing it wrong for which value? Because it's not going to get clean enough or because I'm wasting water or because I'm at risk of chipping or because I'm at risk of poking our, our each other or because there might you know, be a hygiene issue. What is it? So already we can, as a kind of a conversation starter, that was your question a long time ago, Deborah. Um, we can see I'm so much more curious and interested about having this dishwasher conversation. I'm not defensive anymore. I'm feeling fascinated, like, oh, so you've done it this way all this time because you believe in whatever it is, you know, and I've done it all this time. Be this way, because I have this other belief, this other value. And now here's the gold, Deborah. Um, you know, instead of sitting around doing a, a jigsaw puzzle together, can we sit around and put these puzzle pieces together as a family? And here's a phrase that I love. The phrase is, given that. So Deborah, given that, let's <laughs> say you're the one who wants, you know, good hygiene, but given that Joe wants, um, you know, as much time with the family as possible. And given that I want to save water, let's put the puzzle pieces together. What can we do as a family to honor all of our different values? And now we can use our creative problem solving and our empathy and our compassion and our sense of humor and build it together. <laughs> I love that. All right. Given that and curious. Mm -hmm. Interested. Oh, I love that also. All right. I have another puzzle for you. Okay. Where does sarcasm come in? And I say, I say that because from the very beginning, Sarah, and this is me, maybe I have a communication problem. I should probably see you. But <laughs> <laughs> from the very moment you first said, when you've got somebody else now giving you helpful suggestions, every time you said helpful suggestions, I was like, okay, sarcasm, sarcasm, sarcasm. Where does that come in and how does that hurt communication? Well, sarcasm has an edge to it and, and you know that and you feel it. Um, when we are truly playing, we could maybe get around, get away with some sarcasm. Um, when sarcasm is pushed a little further, it can turn into contempt. Um, contempt is a one up to a one down position. It's saying, I know better than you. My way is better. And sarcasm has a kind of a hint of that, like, uh, I, I, I don't believe you. I'm not buying this. You know, my skepticism is more important than your point. Um, and, and again, we can maybe do this in a playful way. Um, this is a good moment to, to bring up Dr. John Gottman, who is um, a world-renowned couples researcher. And what he found in good relationships is the ratio of positive statements to negative statements when things are going well between the two of us is 20 to 1. 
But even when we're having a fight in successful relationships, the ratio of positive to negative is five to one. And so if we are nurturing our positive to negative statements, our positive um, connection with each other, we can probably weather some sarcasm. But if we, if, if our primary mode of connecting with each other is, is sarcastic jab, sarcastic jab, sarcastic jab, we don't have a buffer. We have no positives to, to help us buffer that. Um, and it's very common that I have couples and I'm encouraging them to say warm things to each other and they really want to dive back into sarcasm. They really want to bat it away. Oh, we don't do that. Um, but that keeps us at a distance. It really is, an, is, a, is a distancing arm's length kind of a dynamic. That was super helpful. Thank you so much. Okay. So you have really the the lens that's in total focus and I've got one with such a wide angle lens. So if there was a question that I should have asked you on our podcast today, what would that have been? Did I miss anything? Mm. <laughs> well, I think I, I'm not sure that you missed a question, but I think the the take home point I would really love people to leave with today is that we, as I think I said, we can um, embrace being leaders in our own households in creating as great an environment of safety and calm as we possibly can. Um, you know, I don't know if your family is like mine, but we're diving in and out of anxiety over the situation right now. So anything that I can do to decrease tension, decrease anxiety, decrease sense, sense of danger and increase safety and calm between the two of us or between all of us living here, um, that's going to benefit our relationship and our communication. So that's my main takeaway and trying to think through what we want to say and avoiding startling each other, avoiding surprising each other. Um, that will take you really, really far. So rich. Dr. Rattray, thank you so much for being here. And can you tell listeners where to, where to get more Dr. Rattray, where to find you? Well, you know, what I'd really love uh, people to start with is I actually have a quiz that you can take through the lens of your, you know, romantic relationship, or you can just think about it in your relationship with a person that you're, you know, currently living with or something. Um, and after you uh, take the quiz, not only will you get back your results, but you'll get um, a, a downloadable guide that steps through what I've been talking about today and more. So it's super helpful to have calm and safe conversations, and you can share it with the people that you are in relationship with. Um, so that link is couplescommunicationinstitute.com slash crisis quiz. So if you go there, um, you'll take the quiz, you'll get the download. I'm sure that you will get a lot out of it. Um, and my other website is drsarahrattray.com, but I have to admit, I still haven't fully pivoted to this time of ours. So um, some of the information there is not exactly up to the very moment. <laughs> This moment that we're in. Yes. yes. So much. And listeners, I'd love it. If you have a question, you can leave it below the show link today at flipping50.com forward slash couples communication. And I'd love to hear from you. And if you found this episode as helpful as I did, please share it with a friend. And what are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 together. 